I've partnered up with the San Antonio River Authority to walk you through the construction of a major sewage lift station project. And it's crane day. Check out that all-wheel steering. At the end of the previous episode, this 300-ton mobile crane had just finished getting set up on site with its outriggers and more than 100 tons of counterweight. And the contractor brought in another, smaller mobile crane to help get trucks unloaded. The main part of this sewage lift station is called the wet well, and the main components of the wet well, precast concrete ring segments, have just started arriving at the site. It is almost a universal human experience to enjoy watching big things get built. So why not do it with a tour guide? I'm your host, Grady Hillhouse, and this is Practical Construction. Crane day is a big day, not just because of the size of the equipment on site. There's a lot that can go wrong when lifting and moving heavy loads, so there are a lot of people on site to make sure things run smoothly. It might seem like overkill, and it might seem like a lot of folks just standing around, but some days you have to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And spoiler alert, the only problem that happened this day was a flatbed truck carrying counterweights getting high-centered in the driveway. That's why the contractor decided to bring in another crane. This way, delivery trucks can stay on the road, get offloaded, and be on their way without any difficult maneuvering that might put a kink in the day's busy schedule. The first piece of the lift station's wet well is, naturally, the bottom. The rest of the wet well will sit on this concrete base. The crew takes it off the truck with the first crane, but before it's picked up by the big crane and set into place, it needs a little work. These concrete segments are designed to easily stack on top of each other. However, a concrete-to-concrete -concrete seal held together by gravity is not very watertight. And trust me, for large containers full of raw sewage, it's best that they don't leak. So the crew is installing compressible gasket material anywhere concrete surfaces will mate together. And to make sure that everything slides together just right, they're also applying lubricant to the rubber gaskets. Once it's ready, the bottom segment is attached to the crane with chain slings and slowly swung around to the excavated area. Workers keep the heavy concrete slab under control using attached ropes called tag lines as it's lowered toward the hole. Spotters keep a watchful eye on everything and every one on site to maintain safety. The signal person is the eyes and ears of the operator. They use a combination of radio and sometimes hand signals to guide the motions and directions of the crane. Slow is the name of the game because sudden movements can cause the load to swing or crash into the side of the shoring. And even a little crash can be a big deal when you have as much momentum as this concrete slab. Once the bottom of the wet well is just above the mud slab, workers take measurements and communicate with the signal person to make tiny adjustments and get the slab in just the right place. When it's perfect, they make the call to set it down. Crews disconnect the slings so that the crane can move on to its next load. It's not the next wet well segment, but actually some heavy duty tools to help workers guide each segment into place. These scissor lifts just barely fit into the corners of the excavation around the edges of the wet well, but they'll help the crew reach the higher joints and keep an eye on each segment as it's lowered into place. The next segment of the wet well is the first actual ring that will sit on the base. 
just like the base, it arrives on a flatbed truck that needs to be offloaded by the small crane. And just like the base, it needs gaskets and lubricant to seal perfectly with the precast segments above and below it in the stack. Attaching the ring segments directly to the crane hook using chain slings would put too much horizontal force on the concrete, potentially causing cracks or breaks. Instead, the crew uses a spreader bar between the segment and the hook. This spreader keeps the forces in the chain slings vertical so they don't squeeze the concrete and cause undue stress during the lift. Once the segment is off the ground, the crew can lubricate the recess where it will slide onto the bottom slab. You can see smaller precast concrete manhole segments in the background there. Those will be installed in a future episode. Just like before, the segment is swung around to the excavation, then carefully lowered into the hole. The crew in the hole tells the signal person what they need, and he tells the crane operator what to do. Before long, the second segment is in place resting comfortably on the base. Each following segment goes through essentially the same process. First, offload from the truck. Next, gaskets and lube it up. Then, hand off to the big crane and lower it into place. disconnect, and send the crane back for the next one. Oh, and don't forget the pizza break for lunch. Each one of these segments weighs about 15 tons, roughly the weight of an average city bus. That's nothing to sneeze at, especially if it's hanging above your head. As the day wears on, the work starts to click into a predictable pace. Everyone has a job to do, and they anticipate the needs of others. The worksite gets quieter as everyone settles into the rhythm, and slowly but surely, these massive pieces are installed one by one. When the penultimate segment goes into place, the scissor lifts can't reach any higher. So the mobile boom lifts come out to help the crew lower the final segment into place. This one is a little bit smaller than the others to make up the final height of the wet well. Eventually, this segment will be attached to the surface concrete slab and given an access hatch, but we're still quite a ways from then. And just like that, we have a wet well installed. It's a relatively minor milestone in the project, but a major accomplishment for the day to have everything go so smoothly and be able to be home by dinner. Even though the wet well is in place, that doesn't mean it's ready for the dirty job of holding raw wastewater. A crew lowers a scissor lift into the wet well to make it easier to access the inside walls. They install grout by hand into each of the joints between the precast segments to protect any exposed gaskets and help seal any potential leakage paths. Once the grout cures, it's painted with waterproof coating. This isn't the final protective coating that will go on the inside walls of the wet well, but it will work together with the grout at the joints to reduce the chance of leaks. To prove it, the wet well is required to go through a leak test before it's backfilled to make sure it's watertight. That's as simple as filling it to the brim with water and leaving it for several days. At the end of the test, if there's still water at the rim, minus an allowance for evaporation, and no visible leakage on the outside, the wet well is good to go. The crew did a little bit of epoxy injection into some small cracks as a precaution during the leak test. That's the source of the foam you can see floating on top of the water. After the required test period, the wet well was certified leak-free and ready for backfill.
Backfilling this wet well isn't as simple as dumping dirt into the hole. It has to be carefully coordinated with the removal of the shoring system we saw installed in the previous episode. Crews fight the rain getting ready to start this process, and they make sure to clean up the muck and mud in the bottom of the excavation because this hole won't actually be filled with soil, as you'll see. Since this shoring system was installed, the ground has had time to settle and shift, increasing the pressure on the panels holding it back. That means getting these panels out is going to be a little bit harder than it was to get them in. The contractor first uses the excavator to bump and push the shoring system around to loosen the panels and free them up. A hydraulic puller is connected to the inner plates to lift them up. But even that wasn't enough in some instances. The reaction forces required to pull these plates up along the guides with the friction of the soil they're holding back are tremendous. A few times, rather than lift the inner panel up, the hydraulic puller instead forced the outer shoring panel deeper into the ground, or bent the reaction beam. With a lot of persistence and a big excavator, they got the panels lifted enough and ready for the first layer of backfill. Rather than trying to compact soil into this tight area, the plans call for controlled low-strength material also known as flowable fill. This is a slurry of cement, fine aggregate, and water that sets up like concrete, although with a lot less strength. It might sound strange at first to intentionally use a material with low strength, but it has an advantage because the contractor is going to have to trench through this backfill later in the project when the pipes are installed. It also saves a lot on cost. Conventional earthwork would be nearly impossible to do well in this narrow excavation, but flowable fill is considered self-compacting, and it won't settle over time. It's used in all kinds of irregular excavations or voids like this where compacting earthen material would be difficult to impossible. In this case, they can pour the flowable fill directly into the excavated area using a wooden chute, and even the irregular areas behind the shoring panels are filled with material that will harden within a few hours and never settle over time. The backfill comes up in batches that equal a few feet or around a meter each, so that the shoring can maintain support of the excavation as the level comes up. The next batch of backfill follows a few days afterward. Now that the shoring system panels are loosened up, they can be lifted up with some gentle but persistent tugs of the excavator arm. This batch of flowable fill is being placed with a pump truck to make it easier to get all the way around the wet well, and the pump truck operator is already getting it set up. The panels are being lifted up just in time as mixer trucks are starting to arrive. Each truck unloads into the hopper of the pump and takes off right away to make room for the next one. The pump truck boom moves the hose to each corner of the excavation to place the flowable fill. There's a little bit of water in the hole, but it's not enough to cause any issues with this backfill operation. The controlled low-strength material continues to backfill the excavation, and all the while, the crew continues working on removing the shoring system for the hole. Over the next couple of days, the crew continues to remove elements of the shoring system from the excavation so that they can continue backfilling. Before the flowable fill trucks show up, the crew works to get the final panels pulled out. Rather than pull them all the way out before the previous layers of backfill set, some of these panels were left in the ground while the flowable fill cured. That balanced the earth pressure on the other side, making them easier to pull out. Getting them out last also makes the access a lot easier. They work on cleaning up the shoring system so it can be sent back, 
and they also clean up the excavation to remove loose soil so they can continue to backfill using flowable fill. And they're just in time for the trucks to start showing up. Mixer truck after mixer truck arrive to continue filling this hole up to the top of the second stage of excavation. Almost looks good enough to drink. Once that layer of fill has cured, it's time to start backfilling with soil. First, any uncompacted soil is removed from the excavation to make sure there are no loose pockets of dirt. The backfill soil is brought into the hole, spread out in an even layer called a lift, and then compacted into place. Every once in a while, a technician checks the backfill with a density gauge to make sure it meets the specifications. A lot of important parts of the project will eventually sit on top of this fill, so it's important that it won't settle over time. A surveyor comes out the next day to mark out the next step of the project. Even if it won't settle much, the compacted soil might settle a little bit, so the most important parts of the project will sit on flowable fill all the way up. It's just easier to backfill the entire area with soil and only carve out the spots that need to be flowable fill afterwards. An excavator carefully cuts away the areas that will eventually be backfilled with the flowable material. The next day, it's more flowable fill. Truck after truck arrive to backfill this excavated area just like a bathtub. It's almost hypnotic. All in all, it took 11 truckloads of flowable fill to finish out this part of the job. And the San Antonio River Authority's newest wet well is backfilled not far from where the ground surface will eventually be. We started this episode with a big dirt hole, and now we have a big concrete hole. You might be wondering, where are the sewer pipes, and how is wastewater supposed to flow into the wet well? Installing those pipes for this sewage lift station, and a whole lot more in the next episode of Practical Construction. But if you can't wait to catch that next episode, it's already live on Nebula at the link below. Practical Construction is an experiment for me. It's not like anything else you've seen me do on this channel, but I think watching construction is nearly a universal human joy especially if you can do it with good photography, helpful explanations, and, of course, a friendly host. I think we deserve to see how the constructed environment we depend on gets built around us, even if a five-part series on sewage infrastructure isn't the best fit for the YouTube algorithm. That's why the series is best seen on Nebula. If you, like me, have given up on the TV networks but don't want to give up on high-quality educational content, Nebula's got you covered. And unlike TV, you'll never see an ad or interruption on Nebula. You've probably heard me talking about it before. It's a streaming platform built by and for independent creators. No high-powered industry executives deciding what projects get the green light. Just people like me who are passionate about a topic they want to share with the world. Nowhere else are you going to see someone spend a year on a construction site just to show you where your wastewater goes. And Nebula just keeps getting better and better totally ad-free videos from excellent educational channels, original series and specials that can't be found anywhere else, and even classes from your favorite creators like Dan Schiffman from The Coding Train. I know there are a lot of streaming platforms out there right now and no one wants another monthly cost to keep track of, but I also know that if you're watching a show like this to the end, there's a ton of content on Nebula that's going to be right up your alley. So I've made it dead simple. Click the link below and you'll get 40% off an annual plan. That means you pay just one time 
$30 for an entire year's access to Nebula. That's less than $3 a month. Help me show the world how cool construction can be and get the best viewing experience on the internet while you're at it by clicking that link in the description below. Thank you for watching and let me know what you think.